Hello everyone and welcome back to Vocal Arts. I hope you guys are ready for my conversation with Will Liverman, one of the most exciting singers in the opera world. He performs on many of the world's greatest opera stages and has also taken a turn into composing operas as well. Please welcome Will Liverman. Well, hi everyone and thanks for coming. Whether you are watching on YouTube or listening to the podcast, I'm here with Will Liverman and I'm going to pass the baton over to him and let him give a little introduction as to who he is and what he's up to these days. Hey y'all, uh, my name is Will Liverman um, and I'm an artist. I'm based out in Chicago, Illinois. It's my home. And yeah, I've, um, you know... Over the past few years, I've been doing a um, kind of a combination of, you know, more of the things that I love outside of, you know, I, I, I perform as an opera singer, um, but I also loved, you know, to collaborate with other artists and in creating, you know, programs for recitals and commissioning composers um, and stepping a bit into creating myself. Um, and writing music and um yeah it's really been a joy to go on this journey and um yeah awesome awesome so where did this journey start for you exactly did you grow up in a musical home were you exposed to opera specifically at a young age where did you kind of catch the bug yeah it all I, for me it was my parents um my mom was a gospel singer i grew up in church so um music was always in the house um and i had a very strong background in gospel music my dad actually played piano like a little bit and um he majored for a year in trumpet um so they both you know had the musical gene and i um got into classical music that took piano lessons as a kid uh taking um doing classical piano. Um, and then I sang in the chorus or sing in gospel choir. But for opera, that didn't come along until high school. Um, I auditioned for the Governor's School for the Arts, which was an all performing arts high school based in Norfolk. And they had uh, different disciplines like dance, musical theater, um, you know, visual arts, and they had a voice program. And I ended up auditioning for voice um, and ended up being in this program, which I wasn't even sure what it was. I thought it was going to be like a, I don't know, like an R&B singing school. Like, I just wasn't sure what to expect. And it turned out to be basically an opera school, you know, for high school students. And that's where I learned or was introduced into opera. And that sort of shifted everything. Was yeah. it overwhelming at first to be expecting what you said, hip hop and R&B, and then to be thrown opera, where you're like, what is going on here at this school? Yeah, it was, um, yeah, the audition. Um, I didn't know any Italian or anything, because that was like one of the things you could audition with, like one of the art song, the 24 Italian art songs. Um, so I ended up singing the Star Spangled Banner. And um, yeah, I remember day one of the, of because we actually are, it runs throughout the school year, so um, but we started in August, like an intro camp into governor school. And we started with this opera chorus. Um, and I think it was in a different, I think it was in German. And I was so lost. Like I had never, but every, but just to hear everyone around me was so cool because I had never had, you know, come across anyone else who had sung classical music and everyone was just so welcoming and it was cool to be around other artists that were, you know, also pursuing this thing. And everyone's coming from different schools, you know, from out the Hampton Roads area to be a part of this program. And um, yeah, I learned so much and, you know, it really was a life-changing thing. Did you find mm -hmm. that you like naturally really liked opera or at first, were you like, I'm not so sure about this? Or were you immediately like, oh, this is amazing. Let's let's dive deeper. Yeah, I wasn't so sure about it. I think I went to see a few operas with Virginia Opera. And I think that was, 
the hook and if you like I love the art form and what it had to offer but I wasn't sure if it was something that I was going to pursue professionally um but the more I kept doing it the more it kind of grew on me um and I think one of the game changers was going to New York uh Mr. Fisher our high school teacher Mr. Robert Brown they ran governor school for the voice department and so they took all of us to New York City um on a field trip and we got a chance to go to the Met Opera and hear all those performances and that was quite an experience just because I had never seen opera just like on such a grand scale and it was such a big theater and we had nosebleeds but I was so impressed how these singers were projecting their voice all the way to the back of the hall and seeing all of the cool sets like everything is just so grand and great um and that was just a pivotal moment I think where it's kind of like the light bulb went on um like hey this could maybe be something that I could make a career out of um and then it just sort of kept growing from there yeah I feel like a lot of young singers probably have that thought but not many actually make it to the Met <laughs> like you have <laughs> yeah, yeah. and you ended up going to Juilliard for your undergrad is that correct I went to Wheaton College um out uh, for Miss West Chicago for undergrad but I did go to Juilliard for my master's oh, okay that's what I had mm -hmm. okay so what yeah. was your experience like at Wheaton does that program have strong opera did you get to do a lot of productions as an undergrad singer yeah Wheaton was interesting because I didn't know anything about that I, like a friend of mine who's a also at governor school went there again she was a year ahead of me and so that's how I heard about it um it was the only school I applied for that was out of state and it you know had a strong conservatory program but there was no grad program so we got a chance to do all of all the undergrads got all the opportunities so um and i had a really great voice teacher i can't thank her i mean i still she's still someone that i go to uh from time to time just to check in and just you know as a human just someone that's very much you know, I, I care about Dr. Hart a lot and she, you know, kind of nurtured me at the school and um, really pushed me a lot. She pushed me to apply to Julia. I didn't think I was good enough to get in. I didn't even want to spend the application fee, you know, because those things are expensive. And it was you kind of had like really pick and choose what schools you're going to apply for. And like and Julia was not on my list. Um, she encouraged me to, you know, just go out there and and do it you know you just you don't know unless you try and she had a lot of faith in me um but so yeah I, you know Wheaton turned out to be a great experience because of the faculty that you know really were just great people great educators um and they cared you know and, and um really nurtured us and um yeah I, really had, and the good the the really great thing about being at Wheaton was it was close to Chicago which is now my you know home and I got a chance to be close to a big city so we'd take the train in um on weekends or whatever to go see the lyric or something and just experience the Chicago art scene which was really cool to see the you know professionals out there and CSO and lyric and cot um and experience live art so um that was also a big plus to being at Wheaton and close to chicago awesome where else did you apply aside from juilliard for grad school uh i was applied to rice and manhattan i think okay. um right i was very very close to going to rice that was going to be um one of the or that was yeah that was um one of my top choices and they're both great schools got oh, a yeah. lot of great friends that go to that went to rice and um but yeah i think having not had a big city i mean not that houston isn't a big city but like you know just having a, the new york experience was something that really drew me there um especially after being you know Wheaton for four years i wanted just something completely different and being immersed in the big city and you know new york is just the mecca of the arts and um that's what led me there <clears throat> did you find that being 
so near to the net in proximity kind of solidified your goals and dreams to to be an opera singer i know that's that's a feeling yeah. a lot of you know colleagues and friends of my own have gotten from juilliard is it, it's just you're right there and you can't yeah you can't miss it and you can't miss the buzz about it yeah you really i mean the thing for me too i was um i mean going from whedon to juilliard was a big uh wake up call like because you new york just you don't have any other choice but to push yourself when you're in new york city like and things like being close to the met and just seeing people do it and, and thrive and like you have to be hungry and continue to practice and elevate your game um and new york really does that to you if you go you know it's just you don't have an option and so being so close to the met and having and even at Juilliard too, I mean, because there's level, you know, there's artist diploma level and opera level, you know, like there's so watching all of my colleagues, you know, colleagues um at school um uh was also kind of lit the fire under me to continue to strive to be better and and you know work hard because you know it's a realization that everyone's good, <laughs> you know, like you get to a point where it's just like, we all can, you know, everyone can, can do it. It's just a matter of, you know, I mean, it's who wants it more a matter of luck. It's just everything combined, but, you know, being in New York, I'm thankful for that experience because it, it gave me the drive. Um, and that, you know, was what you know kept pushing me to hopefully maybe be at the Met one day or just at the very least all I you know wanted to do is just you know have a career um and so that was those two years were really um pivotal for me awesome does Juilliard get to do anything with the Met specifically or I mean I know singers from the Met will give master classes and things like that but do Juilliard yeah. students ever get to like do they ever get invited to be in the chorus of a production mm -hmm. or anything like that well, it's funny you say that because when I started there, they had just started this Met plus Juilliard initiative um, where Met Lindemann singers would come and do a production at Juilliard. And, you know, there was a collaboration between um, the Met and yeah, some of the coaches. And from what I remember of it, it was, you know, we got a chance to work with you know the coaches over there and and conductors and um i can't remember i think it was the bartered bride that was that first met plus juilliard show that i did so yeah there were a few um I'm not sure if they still do that but that when i was there there's um definitely some uh you know there's a collaboration with the uh, met <clears throat> awesome and then from juilliard i know you ended up at the ryan center with lyric mm -hmm. at some point was that directly after your master's at juilliard did you or did you have a gap or anything between those two yeah it was um the summer between my first year of the master's and second year i went to santa fe opera as a young artist um and i did the at the end of the season all the young artists sing an aria for um all of the you know there's the press week where all of the opera companies and artistic directors everyone uh that's important you know they come and listen to us and it was when the ryan that was when the ryan center heard me and they invited me to the finals at the start of my second year my master's and i found out that i got in right when my, my second year started so i had a hard time <laughs> <laughs> focusing because I already knew where I was going. So I was like, ah, you know, um, but it was, it was cool because that was an unexpected track for me. I didn't, um, again, it was one of those cases where I thought Ryan center was something that, you know, would be down the line when I was a bit older, but you know, there's a, a few spots that were or a baritone spot that opened up and, um, yeah, I ended up going to, to Chicago Lyric. <clears throat> Fantastic. And that's an exceptional program. How much did you get to do on the main stage? Because it's it's such a big house. I mean, it's one of the houses that brings in, you know, the world's biggest opera stars. Did yeah. you, as a young artist, get a chance to do roles on the main stage while you were there? Was it more covering or like only bit yeah. roles or what? 
Right. It varies from each to, you know, every young artist. For me, I did a lot, mostly covering. And I had a few small roles. Like, so we do sing on the main stage and, you know, they they do call you up if someone goes down. Um, and uh, I've had a few friends that, you know, people that were in the program with me went on for some main roles um, when the uh, artist got sick. And so there are opportunities um, to uh, get that experience on stage at Lyric as a, as a young artist. It's just every year, of course, varies with what you do based on the rep and what they need. Um, but yeah, I, I did, um, they call me one liner Liverman because I always had, I think I had one line. I did uh, Verter, the line in Butterfly where Posterita, I had a few lines of Boheme as the security, the one of the security guard, the guards in um, Boheme and like got some experience. I think I did a, um, what else did I do? Actually, no, one of the cool parts, though, is like, you know, coupled with the main stage stuff at Lyric, Ryan Center was great because I did do a lot of like concerts and things with the Civic Orchestra, um, you know, recitals. And so you do get a lot of experience and other aspects of performing, which are very important to the career, too, um, you know, depending on what you want to do. But for me, um, it was great because... You know, I love doing recitals and I got a chance to do a lot of concerts. Um, that year, I think they just started working with the radio station there. So we would do, cons uh, you know, recitals that would be broadcast um, at WH. I can't remember the station, but it was good practice to be able to, like, you know, record um, and kind of feel what that is like. And that, that sort of pressure is just, you know, every aspect of performing is slightly different you know and uh all of those things were really beneficial for me um i did yeah and i did, ended up doing three years there so yeah. okay the full the full run yeah did, did, <laughs> you, full. did you happen to sing la cena e pronta in traviata no they up oh i got i did the marquee <laughs> so i did yeah so that's another one so traviata I, actually that was a good role because i um uh, that was fun um but yes, I did the marquee for that one. <laughs> okay, yeah. you missed you missed out on the, that great one liner. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> cool, man. Okay, so after lyric, what was the next step? I assume uh, on to the pro, the pro circuit after lyric. Yeah, yeah, and that's you know that's the hardest shift for everybody. Um, when I can't remember the coach, but um, I remember a coach that said to me you know, the first three years out of a program or out of, once you're done with education, no matter how far you take it and you decide to jump into the deep waters of <laughs> the professional career, it's rough. And it was rough for me because you're competing against everybody, you know, and I, um, I was thankful to, you know, have management on my behalf. Like I, I was, um, doing auditions but it was just a slow start like i was getting things here and there but it wasn't you know quite a, you know it's just that that hope that you have when you look at the season and things are just you got gaps places and you're just trying to make your way through and like just figure it out so i would still be doing a lot of competitions to help you know on the financial side of things and keep me afloat and to be able to still pay for coachings and, and uh, flying to New York for auditions because it all mm -hmm. gets costly. Um, so, you know, I, that's the thing is just, you got to keep grinding because um, you're out there and you're competing against everybody else. So you have to find any opportunity that you can um, to just keep going, you know, like in keeping your name out there Um and the most important thing is, well, this is the same thing, but it's just yeah, being super proactive. Even if you, even if you have a manager, that doesn't solve all your problems. Like it's not a magic wand, and then your, you know, schedule is filled full of things. You know, you still have to send those emails to, you know, a director that you worked with and it went really well, and like, you know, just keeping those 
uh, touch points and um, connection points with other people um, just because that all matters. You never know when someone's going to be in a position to offer you a job and um, and yeah, it's just that's the that's the hard part. The hardest part is spending a thousand dollars or so to go to New York and be stressed out and fly there. You have audition that that day you just barely get there. You warm up and then you don't get the gig. You know, <laughs> that's the stuff. Like, and the more you do it, the more we. It's just kind of like second nature, but it's still hard. You know, it's that's but that's really the the career you know what you what you really want to strive for and you you take a lot of l's <laughs> <laughs> but on the plus side though i'll say and this is you know for people that are you know singers that are like starting out the career you know can be like a domino effect in that way you get that one yes after nine no's and that one yes turns into another opportunity which turns into three opportunity you know like so you know everyone has a different path and you just have to trust the path that you're on is, you know, leading you to good things. Um, and, you know, just be proactive and, you know, keep it going. Awesome. That, well, that answers, I had, I had a question specifically about your advice for people trying to traverse that gap from young artists yeah. to pro. Cause I know that's a big deal. So that you pretty much just answered all, all the questions yeah. I was asking oh. there. Uh, Brilliant, man. So yeah, basically keep going, keep grinding, no matter yeah. how good you are. I mean, you have you have a, a wonderful career right now, and even someone who's found your success still face trouble, face difficulty during that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Things as we've one lesson we can all take away is things can change on the dime with the pandemic. You know, like yeah. you just have to be ready to navigate and shift gears at, at any moment. Um, and it's not as I'm making it sound like it's a really turbulent, but it's just like, you just gotta be open-minded. And I think the good thing now is we have so much, I mean, with one of the pluses I think of social media now is, you know, we can build our own platforms, um, which is very, I think, beneficial and, and useful for our careers. Um, and, you know, I'm a big believer. I preach this all the time, you know, if you feel like you have other desires and passions, do those things. You can sing opera and still be a visual artist or, um, you know, whatever the case may be, like you can do multiple things and still, you know, pursue uh, the career. Um, and I think that's, uh, yeah, something that, that took the pandemic for me to realize like getting more into creating and feeling like I needed, you know, license to do that when um, all you need is that, you know, whatever, when the, the voice is telling you to do it, you know, you follow that thing um, and trust it. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like accomplishing being an opera singer, in addition to these other pursuits, it, a lot of it, a like passion for whatever you're going after and B like good time management. We all have the same amount of time each day. If you're really efficient with the time, it's it's shocking how much you can you can do. You can have your 3 to 4 hours purely dedicated to opera per day, which is right. most likely most likely going to be plenty, and then you right. have the rest of the day to work on other stuff. Right. Yeah, yeah. Time management is is key because that's the thing. You know, you once you finish school, there's not going to be someone typing up a schedule to tell you where to go. You got a coaching in three or four and then you go down to hurt. Like that's gone. No one cares. Like you <laughs> don't have to, I mean, you know, you know, it's, it's true. You have to be in charge of your own schedule and like, no one's going to tell you to, you know, email that conductor or go do that competition. Like you have to do that for yourself. And like, I still do like every Monday, like on not every Monday, but like, I will take time on Mondays just to like, you know, Liverman headquarters. Like, what do I need to do? I'll make a list of like the people I need to email the, if I have a passion projects that are in the works, like what am I doing to make steps in those things? You know, like you have to, that's the only, or we all have different ways of, you know, doing it, but like you have to hold yourself accountable. Like that's the foundation of it. If you don't, 
you know, no one's going to do it for you. Yeah, absolutely. I want to jump forward a little bit to fire shut up in my bones, which is just such an incredible piece of art. Um, I watched it when it came out and I've just been rewatching it recently. Um, and it's just, it's just brilliant. And so I'm just curious how that opportunity came up. And then I want to get into, you know, what it was like being a part of that and working with Terrence and, uh, all the, all the cool things that went into that, that production at the, yeah. Yeah. That, um, that happened during the, the pandemic out of, um, everything that was going on, you know, I've, remember telling people before I was all the jobs that went away, um, you know, we're all dealing with the force majeure contracts and things being canceled. And I was actually starting to take classes and on Coursera digital marketing, just like, I, you know, speaking about talking about shifting gears, <laughs> you know, I didn't know which way it was going to go. Um, so, but you know, throughout the pandemic, opportunities presented themselves and I was you know doing virtual things here and there and one day I got a phone call from Alex my manager um and he said that I can't remember maybe this I can't remember the year but before fire um uh during the pandemic he called me and said that the Met was planning on doing fire shut my bones they had like pushed they had it planned for a later season but they decided to shift it to open the season um and they wanted me to audition for the role of charles and i didn't know anything about fire shut my bones other than seeing pr from it from opera theater of st louis when they premiered it but i didn't know what the content of it um and so yeah i during the pandemic i it was first of all it was like a disbelief to even get a call like that you know um because i just i mean it's completely unexpected uh, and I just learned the aria in a few days because it was like a quick turnaround. They wanted the the audition tape in a, like in, a, in a, a week or something. So I learned it and I sent it in. And then it was one of those things where I was just expecting never to hear because we're trained to do that. You know, like <laughs> uh, I didn't know how many other, we didn't know how many other people they were auditioning for it. Um, but it was like maybe two days later, Alex calls me again and it's like, Rolls yours, you know, you're going to be opening <laughs> the best season pending that, you know, we can get back into all the houses safely. And it was a contract that was signed. Then maybe three months later after that, I was flying to New York for a head, a photo shoot. Um, and I didn't at the time didn't know what the photo shoot was going to be for, other than I knew it was going to be for some PR, but I didn't know what degree until I find out when I get to New York, oh, so that's what happens. You know, I would look at the side of the bus and see this big picture of fires on my bones and me, me mugging all of New York. Um, <laughs> that was like a complete out of body experience to go from sitting on your couch during the pandemic and wondering <laughs> what's going to happen with life. And then all of a sudden things are coming back kind I mean the delta variant was coming around so there's still lots of you know I remember that you know that initial season in 21 where people were coming back in the theater but still very much it could have gone either way you know so there was lots of things going on at the time um in my mind you know but um the experience was great I mean Terrence uh, to answer your question with working with Terrence he was really great we I got a chance to meet him in St. Louis and we, I sang some stuff for him and then um, we retweaked the role a bit um, because the uh, artist who premiered is a, more of a bass baritone. So uh, we shifted a few of the scene, you know, taking him up a half step or a whole step and like, just kind of, and that's the great thing about Terrence, you know, it's so collaborative, you know, super collaborative and super chill. Like he's really wants to make sure that you're, you know, feeling good about what you're doing and it's just open-minded and, um, you know, he just brings such a good energy um, to the room and, you know, easy to talk to. Uh, and I, yeah, I really enjoy working with him. <clears throat> That's amazing for, for such an accomplished composer to be open to changing yeah. stuff. Just like, yeah, let's change it. Fine. Whatever works better. 
Right, right. You know, and I think I would probably attribute that to, you know, his jazz, the jazz world of like, let's just figure it out. Not that, it's, you know, it's just, but the open mindedness of like what collaboration, yeah. like what it needs, you know, that's what I, you know, admire. Um, it's, this didn't work. Right, let's do this. You know, like, <laughs> that, yeah, right. Like you something and, and make it stronger, you know? Um, yeah. Especially with new works because, it's new, you know, so it's not everything can be set in stone. I feel like that's something and I hope that we're seeing, um, you know, with these new works and how they're built is, you know, I think you always have an opportunity to learn something at every stage, you know, even after, I mean, Opera Theater St. Louis, they opened fire and yet they were he was still making changes you know, to it for the Met stage and changing some things and like rewriting and adding arias. And that's what they did back in the day. You know, all we talked, all the shows that get revi revised. And, um, and I think that's one of the special things about, you know, having living, breathing uh, composers and librettists, you know, the work can still grow and, and evolve, which is cool. Was that your Metropolitan Opera debut, that role? No, um, my Met debut was in another new opera by uh, Nico Muley Mar Marnie, um, where okay. Isabel uh, was a title role. Um, and that was a really great production. Um, I enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, it was... Uh, oops, did I lose? Oops. Um, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was in 2018, I think. Um and yeah, it was a fantastic cast. I and that was, you know, to make a Met debut in a new production was really cool. Um, and then I did Akhenaten uh, by Philip Class and did a few produ uh, performances of Papageno in their in their holiday uh, production. Um, oh, okay, okay, yeah. <clears throat> so, so uh, Fire Shut Up was number four, I guess. So you see, you're. You you were pretty mm -hmm. familiar with the company at that point. Yeah, yeah. I'd done, you know, uh, a few things by then. But still, you know, like I, it was still shocking to be asked to step in to the Met in this way and like actually leave the show, um, you know, coming out of a two year hiatus and being uh, shut down with COVID. Like it was, um, it was a lot, you know, I was overwhelmed, but also realized that the moment was bigger than me and I had to I wanted to do well for for Terrence and for for everybody you know like it was such a big moment um and we all supported one another in that time it was I'll never forget the opening night and um you know we heard over the and the speakers you know places and we hear the orchestra start tuning and then people just start busting out applauding um and it was that was when it started you know the spark and the energy starts really fill the space and we were just ready to do this performance <clears throat> of fire and just gave it our all and and we're and a shout out to uh angel and latanya two leading ladies you know two vets that supported me and just to work with them and sing alongside them you know was also a big honor um and yeah, we all carried one another throughout that process. And, 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 um, yeah. Did you feel a lot of pressure putting on this role? Cause it's interesting, you know, if you do a really traditional opera, you're going to be compared to every mm -hmm. singer that's done the role before you, but you do a new opera with, you know, a lot of gravity in the storytelling and such an impactful piece like this is a whole yeah. different kind of pressure. Um, yeah. did you feel that? And how did you, how did you manage that? Yeah, I definitely felt it. I felt it every time I looked at that bus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, um, yeah, you know, it's, I mean, especially if you think about the, the context, you know, it was our first Black composer at the Met. Huge. And we all, I know it's, you know, way overdue and everything, but, you know, the moment was still the moment that we wanted to, you know, um, represent that way. And all of the composers, who's come before Terrence, you know, that have paved the way for us. So in that way, 
and honoring the legacy um, was definitely weighing on my mind. And um, yeah, it was, and to play a living, breathing person. He, he was out in the audience. I met Charles <laughs> Blow. Um, and his story is so important and poignant. And a lot of folks resonated with that. It was, you know, it wasn't just a black story. You know, people um, were, would come up to me after the performance and just say that this is their story and how they felt seen. And um, and that was, you know, that's the power of art. And, you know, it was an honor to, you know, step into um, the retelling of this, you know, story about Charles and um, be that vessel for the for this, you know, the story to to uh, come alive. And um, yeah, it's, it, that, that's the time that I'll never I don't think I'll ever forget. It just, yeah, it was so significant. Absolutely. Uh, did you feel any difference between the the live and HD performance versus the rest of them? And and how do those work differently from a performer standpoint? Oh, just way more cameramen. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. That there's all like, and they all got that thing down to a science, man. It's just like they record a few of the. I can't remember which performances they do. Like a, they record a something before the HD is like a test. I think it's the show before, I don't know, some other show. Um, so they have footage, like two recordings in case something goes way south, they'll have options. But um, that definitely, I felt the pressure of of that with the Marnie because I was Chris Maltman, who was the lead. Oh, he, Barry, love Chris. Marnie. Yeah, he you know, it was the HD for Marnie, and I was super nervous just because, <clears throat> like, we know that this this is going to be seen all over the world, and um, is the camera going to be looking at me in the place where I'm, you know, like, you're trying to you start <laughs> thinking, it, like, man, just treat it like another performance. All it is, like, it's just another performance. And that always stuck, you know, it's just, that's kind of carrying that into the HD is so important because the minute you start to overthink it and think about or at least for me anyway um all of a sudden the visibility <laughs> just going from like the people that are sharing the experience in the theater to the world um you want you like get in your head and what if i forget the words or crack or do something crazy or fall you know like all this stuff but you know you just treat it like another performance and um and you know like i said the the hd team they really uh have a down like clockwork and you know it's crazy to see all the things they do and how they capture it and it's cool because it's a a different way of, of experiencing the opera and i'm i was thankful for it because my parents you know with covid they weren't able to come see me perform live but they went to norfolk um at the mall and caught the hd which was really special um so yeah yeah it's it's a it's a wonderful thing that the Met yeah. does and and the, and it does look phenomenal. I was just thinking as a performer, you kind of just let the cameraman do their work. Like you do your right. job and they'll do their job and it'll be a great end. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's not like, you know, you don't want to put on a different performance for the camera and all of a sudden do all the stuff you had, you know, like <laughs> they, yeah. Yeah. The thoughts that they have and like they piece it together really well. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That's so cool, man, to hear that, to hear that side of it. Um, I want to get into your work as a composer and your other work outside mm -hmm. of a singer. I just so I'm I'm in this uh production of Frankenstein at Arizona Opera, this world premiere, and and Terrence is here. And Terrence and Katie Beck oh. were talking about you the other day, and I didn't realize you were also a composer. I just somehow missed that. Oh. And I was like, wow, he would be really cool to talk to on the channel. So it was actually, it was their conversation that inspired me to, to reach out to you. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. So when did you start getting into composition itself? And then, and then yeah. what inspired you to actually write an opera? Cause that's just a huge, that's just a colossal yeah. undertaking. Yeah. I don't, yeah. Um, yeah. I guess I got to trace it back to my roots in gospel music because, you know, growing up all of the music that was played was, by wrote by ear you know like everybody that sang 
we would learn from the director and his call and response um, way of learning and having the, the chance to learn how to play piano by ear, you know, you're already creating and figuring things out and, you know, laying down chords and that kind of thing. So I was doing it, but like not realizing I was doing it, you know, um, over the years. And when I got to high school, I actually started to compose like some, a few piano songs, um, and uh, did enter some competitions. But then when the voice program and governor school came into the picture, um, that kind of just stopped. Um, but I would always still keep playing. And that was always, the piano is forever my first passion. Um, and then, you know, getting into the opera, I, um, I don't know, I always, Barbara Seville was my calling card. Um, when I've started to, you know, my career started to take off. And um, I was sitting in a barber shop and was thinking about just observing things and thinking how setting like a, ma a modern day barber of Seville, like in a black barber shop would be so cool just because it's such an opera. The characters <laughs> that come in, people, <laughs> you know, like, the bootleg guy that sells his stuff and no one wants it and like <laughs> all the, the conversation that I had and I sat on it for a long time though I just sort of um in my mind was like someone should write this you know like and turn it into an opera and then every time I revisit it someone should write this someone me I should write it you know like, <laughs> I, like, I I'll start writing or figuring it out like and so I um got in contact with my high school friend we actually had he went to governor school his name's Rico and we uh came up in the voice program together and he switched to jazz and later studied production in school um and he was living in Brooklyn at the time DJing and um doing his thing in New York and I was there for Marty and so that's when um, I reached out and, you know, we reconnected and I told him that, about this idea and, you know, it'd be cool to fuse different styles that we know and love. And like, you know, you appreciate opera from governor school and like, so you, and he, you know, was really open to the idea and loved, you know, the concept and, um, and we just started, you know, making stuff up. Like we just took the Barbara Seville narrative and tried to update it to what it would be it was initially the 90s but then we had a hard time trying to like find i don't like what what if this person hid wouldn't they just do that you know like i don't know we did like it was too little you know we couldn't really make it work having it be really literal with and then in the 90s we we're like well you know if we're trying to reach the youth it's sad to say that the youth don't really know the 90s that i mean it's not it's there's like a little bit of, even though the 90s are great like everyone loves the 90s but we thought to make it present day just to, you know, really make that connection point clear with the youth and something that's, you know, of the now and um, started um, coming up with characters and the show sort of, sort of uh, really found its own way. It's very much like an, uh, an original story we had come up with being inspired by the Barbara Seville characters. Um, and then again, the pandemic was the, was the shift because by that point, when the pandemic hit, we had been working on and off for like two years and we had like five demos. At this point, it was just like songs like, we need, oh, okay, the Barber story should have a love song. It should have a song about hair. It should have a song about this. And, you know, like, so we had like five songs and uh, these demos that we had um, and we started to raise money during the pandemic to keep I mean, we got all this time in our hands. So like, let's really like write this thing. Um, and then uh, I reached out to a few donors from Lyric Opera of Chicago um, to support the piece. And they did, you know, like, oh, I know you were writing music. And I was like, yeah, you know, something to do for fun. I'm working with a collaborator. And, you know, we raised this money. And then Lyric found out about it through, you know, what we were uh, through the, donors and the people that I was reaching out to just with the connection points. And um, 
they lost their season, but they kept their young artists. So they were looking for alternative programming and um, they were like, well, I mean, would you want to workshop this opera with us in the Ryan Center? And we were like, I mean, what are we going <laughs> to <laughs> Absolutely. You know, like, we'll figure it out. Like, you know, you say yes and then figure it out later. So that's basically what we did. You know, we kind of came up, you know, with a loose plot. I mean, it's still that first workshop was still kind of scenes. Like, we just had, like, sketches and ideas. But it was so cool because that was the first time a lot of people had performed was our workshop so coming back into a place to just sing anything i think people were just like happy to be you know out of the house and like um you know doing this uh show and going along on this ride with us and then long story well i mean i'm already telling a long story <laughs> but the fast forward to the end the, those workshops turned into a premiere and uh, which we just premiered in february so um yeah, it's been a wild journey with that piece. And out of that, you know, for me came a passion to just create more on my own and, you know, write art songs. Just I didn't realize how fulfilling creating has been for me the past few years. So it's definitely something that I want to continue doing. And um, yeah. Awesome. 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 So musically, I haven't gotten a chance to hear it. Um, yeah. Musically, what's it like? Do you have you know, full orchestration, very classical moments, but then also hip hop yeah. with electronic elements and, and, and what? It really uh, utilizes um, a lot of um, uh, different styles. And from, uh, we kind of viewed it, you know, the characters have their different styles that they bring out. So my character was more of the, yeah, kind of soulful, hip hop groove and then the tenor who's like kind of after count on Viva had more of an R&B vibe and gospel for the village. So like it definitely uses a lot of different styles and but we use the, you know, barbershop quartet and all that. Um, it's a chamber size orchestra and Rico, um, my co-collaborator was in the pit. Actually, well, he was on the, in the performance, his DJ booth was above, mm -hmm. was on, Age. Uh, and he was way up um, in the in the air there, and it was really cool to have that visual image of the the pit and then the the um, his electronics because he was he would be triggering some of the the beats for some of the hip hop moments. Um, but yeah, it was a wild ride. I mean, I still can't even believe that it happened. You know, when I look at the posters and just. I'll see something about it. I'm like, damn, did we do that? Like, <laughs> yeah. So were there were there microphones and amplification? I mean, there must there had to have been for the electronic oh, yeah. elements, right? Yeah. yeah. That was the one thing where I was like, really for a while, I was like, it can't be amplified because it's opera. And I was like, <laughs> this is not about that. It's about trying to read. You know, like we wanted to have. It's sung, you know, there's operatically sung, and I didn't mind the microphones just because that's just what our sound world called for. Um, and, you know, I wanted to introduce people to the world of opera and, you know, what these sounds are and like just the art form of what it can be. Um, and just for our show, you know, amplification was a part of that, but, you know, you know, they, and I know that's like a big thing that we think about when we, talk about opera being separate from other styles of singing you know it's unamplified um but for new works i think you have some leeway depending on what it is and like the genres that you're using because we also have musical theater singers and like you know and our the way that we wrote it with the beats i mean it's just what we had to do and i think um that's part of you know the experimental uh side of these new works is you know um just exploring and continuing to evolve the art form. It can be opera, can be classic and standard, stand firm, firmly planted and deliver a moving aria in Italian, or, you know, there's lots of ways it could, it could go. But for me, it's people have more connection points and can find their way in any number of ways, you know? Yeah. 
that's a great segue to my next question, which which is one of the one of the last ones I have for you, which is in your mind, what does the future of opera look like? Yeah, man, it's tough. It's tough because a lot a lot of companies are are struggling nowadays. Yeah. You know, that's a great question, Peter. I think uh, <laughs> it's uh, I'm hopeful. I really I think it's change is hard. You know, I think this is. At this plus, obviously, you know, with the pandemic, we're starting to see some fallout from that. And, you know, it's hard for every company right now. Um, but I still think that, you know, with the amount of I'm inspired just with the amount of new things that we're seeing and new ways that we're approaching the the art form, because um, it's never like I, I'm it's never about getting rid of the the classics, you know, I think it's adding to them in a meaningful way where, you know, anybody can find themselves, you know, in an opera. If they look at an opera company and find something that really resonates with them. Um, because we talk about opera as like a total art form, like encompassing all other art forms. So, okay, well, what does that mean? You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but, you know, in terms of the future, you know, I think, um, you know, the leadership is going to be key for you know there's lots of there are people um you know stepping down and new leaders taking over so i think it really you know we have to um as our part as the uh, artists continue to you know keep doing what we do and, and i think it's that's why it's so important that if we have passion projects and things that that inspire us like do those things don't wait on a company to tap you on the shoulder to you know write up or do that you know program that you've been dreaming of find a way to get it done because you are a part of the change um and someone needs what you have to offer so i think that's and we're starting i think you know we're, to be able to see more artists um come out with more albums and recording projects and i think it's it's all leading somewhere good even though right now it's gray and there's lots of reasons to doubt what you know the future of opera um but really if you look around you know i think there's you know the ever you know the revolution the evolution of it is is happening um and i think the, um payoffs for that because we need to reach younger audiences and um get them in on it so you know we keep it um going and keeping it relevant and and you not and you know in terms of you know reaching younger audiences it's not about like i'm not trying to say that only younger audiences can relate with the stories of now like we all have friends that go see barbara seville and love it or bohem and like i never knew i could love like there's so you know that's not what i'm trying to say but i just i think that you know the more that we have out there you know um that's really you know comes from something real um i think the 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 better it is going to be for for the the long term you know, the, the access points to it awesome awesome all right i'm gonna hit you with one question from one of my patrons one of my supporters over there on patreon this is from jenny thompson and she would like to know what your favorite roles are to perform or your favorite roles you have performed favorite roles all right um uh, probably a barbara seville for one it's just it's nice to do something fun papagano is fun um uh roll actually the limari i would say in um limamel is such a fun role it's um it's one of the most challenging things i ever did i did it when i was in the ryan center um but it's just so quirky and weird and like, you know, the <laughs> just how he sets the French, you know, I love singing in, in French. Um, I can't believe I just said that. I used to hate French, but I love <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, a few that came off. And Paleos. I just did Paleos. Um, that was one of the hardest things I've had to learn in my life, but the payoff of it was just <laughs> I mean, music is just so gorgeous. And that was a dream to do that in LA. Um, yeah. Awesome. All right. And lastly, uh, tell us about uh, Malcolm X coming up and uh, any other final words you have to the audience. Yeah, Malcolm X, come see it if you're in New York or check it out in the HD. I think, you know, it's another 
um, really significant work. You know, it premiered in 86 um, at New York City Opera and is making a comeback, you know, it's Detroit and Omaha. Um, and it's so special. Like we just had our orient uh, presentation and getting a chance to listen to Anthony and Christopher um, and Tulani talk about their experience and what the piece means to them. Um, and just the story of Malcolm X, you know, I'm well aware, you know, he's, he, you know, he strikes, he, he um, brings about strong reactions in people, <laughs> you know, either way. <laughs> um, but I'm hoping that in this piece, you know, we bring out, we see the humanity in Malcolm X and you know, why he was so important and significant to <clears throat> American history. Um, and it's definitely you know, not like a retelling, like an autobiography. It's, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, kind of a futuristic, more of a profound, uh, setting of Malcolm X, uh, which I think is really effective. And, um, I mean, it's just, it's one word that I keep coming back to is just epic. It's an epic show. Um, and I love the sound world is, I mean, it's difficult music. We're all counting for our lives, but <laughs> the, into it, it you know really <clears throat> makes you know anthony's a, just a genius with how he writes he's inspired me with i'm looking at some of those rhythms like oh man like you can really you know make this line sing when you like you know mess with those rhythms and just the mm. offbeat like i've really been learning a lot just myself you know from studying the score too so it's cool. yeah I'm yeah i'm really looking forward to, to seeing and hearing that mm -hmm. yeah well well thank you so much for joining me man it's been a real yeah pleasure to talk to you and to to get you to know you even in a in a virtual setting yeah thanks for having me it's been a joy it's great talking to you and uh, best of luck with everything all right thanks cheers hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with will liverman if you'd like to see another great conversation with another great opera singer check out my conversation with lisette oropesa right here go on click it it's a good one